This is Mina Malapetti with another edition of the Seamless Connection podcast. And this afternoon, I'm thrilled to have with me Dr. Patrick Carroll, uh, Chief Medical Officer of Hims and Hers. And he has a wide and varied background, starting with being a primary care physician, going all the way through various roles in various uh, physician groups and uh, care delivery networks, moving on to be the CMO at Walgreens, and now as the CMO at Hims and Hers. Patrick, so thrilled to have you on the show. Yeah, great to be here, Mina. Um, would you, for the audience that doesn't know you uh, already, would you give us a little bit more about um, what you do at Hims and Hers and what you've done over your background, quite frankly, that brought you to Hims and Hers? Sure. I think I'll start from the beginning, you know, what my healthcare journey has been leading up to Hims and Hers, because in retrospect, it kind of all fits. But at the time when I was doing these various positions, they didn't all fit. Um, so primary care physician, uh, by practice and training for over 28 years as a family physician, seeing folks from, I would say, from nursery to nursing home, the whole gamut, including inpatient care. Um, and I loved it. It was 30 patients per day. It's a hard job, most difficult position I ever had, uh, but really got to know patients. You really get to know the healthcare system when you're a family physician because you see everything and you care for folks with various conditions and a, a lot of behavioral health overlays that you see in primary care. Um, I would say the one part of my career that really informed the rest was when I got done with my residency in family medicine, <clears throat> I had to pay back four years to the National Service Corps. I came from a large family and they paid for my med school. I thought I was going to end <laughs> up in uh, a rural town in Vermont with the foliage and everything. Instead, when <laughs> my time to came back, to pay back came, the government sent me a computer printout and it was all Indian Health Service, which I had no idea what that was all about. So my wife and myself, when my residency ended, we got in a car with my one and three year olds and drove out to New Mexico from Connecticut where I did my training. And there I was uh, at Shiprock, which is a really interesting yeah. part of the Navajo Reservation is the Eastern Edge. And I was a family physician there for um, over four years with the Indian Health Service, really doing the full scope of family medicine, everything from primary care to pediatrics to C-sections, at times assisting on operative orthopedics. So it was like a four-year fellowship, uh, yeah. really applying all of my skills. But what I learned there, and it's really informed the rest of my career, is that you can do a lot in healthcare with limited resources. So if you imagine the Navajo Reservation, per capita spend is significantly lower than what, than what we spend on other areas of this country. And we've been able to, we were able to get great quality outcomes. And so I always learned from there that, you know, you, you need to be aware of what resources you have. You need to focus on quality. Um, you need to engage with your, your patients and you can get good results. So coming from the Indian Health Service after I served back my four time, four years, I went up to New Hampshire where I was most of my career in primary care. I took a lot of leadership roles when I was up there, both at my medical group, but also um, doing utilization management for the hospital, uh, doing a few years as a part-time medical director for our Tufts Health Plan when it came up to New Hampshire, utilization management for Anthem Blue Cross. So did a lot of administrative duties as well as primary care. What happened was that in 2009, a colleague of mine from way back with the Indian Health Service in Shiprock said, Pat, your experience in primary care and particularly with adolescent medicine, which is one of my subspecialties, would be invaluable to do a two-year project. I actually went back to the Indian Health Service, went back to Shiprock, New Mexico, and did a two-year kind of population health project converting um, uh, the system in that area from paper records to a electronic health record, but also setting up school-based health clinics in that area of the Navajo Reservation, doing screening for high-risk adolescents um, for suicidality. It was a great experience, two years that I'll never forget. Fortunately, my wife's an OB nurse, so she was very flexible <laughs> going from New Hampshire <laughs> to Shiprock, starting to Shiprock, going to New Hampshire, then back to Shiprock, New Mexico. But it, I loved it. It really informed the rest of my career uh, because, again, I saw that you can do a lot with a little in populations that really have a lot of health care needs. It's a quick question for you there, yeah. because we see that a lot. And I, and I love that doing a lot with a little because we, we everyone should be doing that right to, to make scarce resources stretch further. But 
Um, can you think of, can you point to anything in particular? Because we have you know, communities throughout the country, not just in IHS, but, you know, in urban, suburban areas or in rural areas that similarly don't have a lot of resources. Um, what could they learn in this particular, like what was done differently at IHS with those scarce resources to help them get those high quality outcomes that maybe we're not following those best practices elsewhere. Can you highlight a, a, maybe a one or two of those best practices? Absolutely. You know, with the Indian Health Service, um, you knew exactly what the spend was in your region. And you were very aware of if someone came in, for example, a high school football player and twisted their knee, they didn't all get MRIs, right? Um, we, did, we, we limited the testing to those who need it and when it was necessary. And every day when we rounded, um, uh, physicians would sit down and say, okay, this patient came in or this situation arose. What kind of testing did you get? What do you expect for outcomes? Is the testing necessary or not? Um, and so I, I learned a lot about resources and using them wisely. That's one thing. The second thing, which I think is equally as important, you realize that it's more than just the physicians who are driving the bus here. We use pharmacists to the top of their license. We had community health workers. Many of them were not necessarily trained in healthcare, but they lived in the communities. You know, they were at the chapter houses, which is essentially like the town halls for these various areas on the reservation. And they were outreach workers. We had uh, visiting nurses. Uh, we had uh, really distributed mental health uh, um, catchment uh, program. And so we use lots of resources. We use them wisely and we use all members of the team. It just wasn't about the physicians. And so even back in 1987, when I was with the Indian Health Service, and even more so in 2009, we were doing population health, quite honestly, before that term was even coined. We were you know, really managing to the best of our ability and, and implementing high quality care for folks as a population and using resources wisely for that population. And I know this is this is actually a, probably a great segue into what you did in other um, other roles later on in your career, which is looking at exactly that, the use of referrals, the use of resources, the use of expensive resources, right? right? Any specialist or imaging or anything like that. Um, and, and that is something I hear all the time, even today, and I'm guessing you heard all the time, you know, after Shiprock? Yeah, so coming from Shiprock in 2011, when my two-year project was done, I, I actually got recruited to be a regional chief medical officer for a large multi-specialty group in Boston called Atrius Health. At the time, they had 2,000 physicians. Um, in, in that area, as it is then, as it is today, they took risk on a lot of patients. So, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the patients, we had some form of risk contracts. That is, you were responsible for both the cost of care but also the quality of care. I think they hired me there because I kind of lived in that world with the Indian Health Service, and I was able to bring some of those principles to the physician at Atrius. What was fascinating about Atrius when I joined there, we were one of the original pioneer ACO groups. And so, you know, the first kind of Medicare share savings program was, which was really uh, foundational in risk-based care in the Medicare population, we had a large segment of our patients who were in those programs. I think over 70,000 Medicare age patients, half of those were in Medicare Advantage programs, the other half were in the Medicare Share Savings Program. So you really learned in that group uh, about resource allocation, high quality care, and really how to deliver the best care at the right time in the right place. We did not have a hospital as part of Atrius. It was a multi-specialty group that really functioned on its own with affiliated hospitals, but we were an independent multi-specialty not-for-profit group, which was a great experience. And I was there for two years and I got kind of poached from to go to an integrated delivery network, which I never worked for in my, in my career. So I got recruited to go to Hartford Healthcare and I was the chief medical officer for their integrated uh, delivery network. And what they had done is they brought in as many physicians as they could under risk-based contracts and had them starting take risk for both the cost and the quality of care. Connecticut at that time really wasn't that far down the road with this model. 
whereas, you know, Boston area was. So they used my experience to kind of help them with some of the risk contracting, but also just bringing in physicians under our risk contracts for multi multiple insurers, including um, the Medicare risk population. I actually enjoyed the work there because I'd never, you know, been a healthcare leader in a system that had both inpatient, outpatient, mental health facilities, uh, you know, home nursing, visiting nursing. It had it all. And it was a challenge trying to get all those pieces to work together, but it was, it was a good challenge. And, and I learned a lot about the health system world then because at Atrius, it was really just about a multi-specialty group and less about the health system. No, that completely makes sense. And then what kind of brought you from there to the Walgreens and the more commercial direct to patient side, as opposed to a health system hospital focused side? It, it's crazy. I, I always answer my emails. And so I got a, a kind of a cold outreach by Walgreens saying, hey, we have these retail clinics. It looks by your background that you could be a, a leader in the retail clinic space. Now, at the time, they had almost 500 retail clinics and I think over 30 markets around the country. I think they were looking at their competitors, CVS, who had close to a thousand minute clinics at that point, and they wanted to build out the retail clinic business. And I looked at it and I said, wow, that is fascinating. I'd never heard about retail clinics, but what I saw was it had a unique way of actually uh, reaching patients where they go. Many, many fa- folks go to a Walgreens or CVS to pick up prescriptions or, or, or pick up various, you know, uh, even groceries and, and, and you know, you, you name it, they go to a Walgreens for it. It's almost like the, the, you know, the neighborhood store. And why not have an access point to healthcare for acute episodic care in these retail clinics? So I was fascinated by that work. And I decided, you know what, I'm just going to throw my hat in there and understand about the pharmacy world, you know, uh, learn about PBMs, learn about, uh, you know, specialty pharmacy, but also learn about retail health as, as these companies were first starting to get into that space. So I stayed at Walgreens for five years as chief medical officer, and a lot of my roles changed there. Uh, I became more involved with their strategy um, as they decided they wanted to bring in full scope primary care, such as their relationship with Village MD into Walgreens. And we kind of uh, deprecated the retail clinics a bit and actually had health systems run those in Walgreens. So it was a time of transition at Walgreens, but I learned a tremendous amount there, not just on the healthcare delivery, but also on the whole pharmacy aspect and, and the cost that uh, pharmacy actually contributes to, you know, uh, to healthcare. It's pretty significantly, particularly around specialty medication. So really interesting work. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I was there five years. I think at the time I was probably the longest serving chief medical officer at Walgreens. And um, <laughs> I was happy there. Um, but again, I yeah. answered my emails and I got recruited <laughs> by a, uh, a company called Hims and Hers, which I knew nothing about, nothing about. And they said, look, we're a startup. Uh, we're doing things that are interesting. You have an interesting background, particularly with your work with retail clinics in Walgreens. And would love for you to come out here to interview for the job. And I was pretty reluctant to start with because I'd never heard of the company. But I asked my three millennials, three kids in their 30s, and said, have you ever heard of Hims and Hers? And they said, Dad, you've got to go to San Francisco and check that out. That's <laughs> We love Hims and Hers. So they identified with Hims and Hers. They identified with the brand. They identified with that access point to care. And sure enough, I found myself in San Francisco interviewing with Andrew Dudum, who's my boss today. And you know what it really appealed to me is that I realized there was an access point for care for millennials and younger, like none other. And that's something that health systems never really could catch on with in terms of they just didn't relate to that demographic. And going back way back to my time with the Indian Health Service, I was always fascinated with access points to care, where people get care, what demographic uh, are you managing, and what is their ability to actually get plugged into a system. And hims and hers um, had that. Now, again, when I started there, they were only in about 25 states. They only had a few healthcare verticals, but the commitment that the board and Andrew made to me is we want to expand. We want to expand into things beyond just sexual health and dermatology. We want to get into mental health. Uh, We recently launched weight loss. So 
we've really expanded tremendously since I started there in 2019, which really excites me. Just in mental health alone, the access to care that we provide is pretty remarkable, quite honestly. So in terms of like virtual care, just overall, and then we'll get into hymns and hers in a second, um, it's been a game changer, right? We, yes. we do virtual special care as well. And it's been amazing, not just through COVID, but even since COVID, how much it's changed healthcare delivery, healthcare access, how it's helping with the fact that we just don't have enough providers to go around. Can you elaborate a bit on how virtual care services are transforming the patient experience, especially in areas like you've worked with in particular, with limited access to traditional healthcare, or maybe for um, specialty conditions that similarly for, for other reasons, uh, social or otherwise, might not be otherwise as easily treated or reached. I'd love to talk on that. I could speak hours on it, but I'll, I'll limit it for, for 20 <laughs> minutes. So um, again, from my experience in the health system world at Hartford Healthcare, and then I'm actually just coming off a two-year uh, rotation as a board director at Christiana Care. So I understand health systems and some of their challenges. And two of the challenges that I think digital health, or I call it healthcare, I don't even like the word virtual or digital, it's truly healthcare. But two of the challenges that health systems have, um, which I think health, the, the virtual health can help address is one is workforce shortages. Um, this has been a real challenge through the pandemic. You know, we're, we're going to be 250, 300,000 nurses short, but we're also going to be 40 to 50, to 70,000 physicians short by 2025. So there's just not enough healthcare workers to go around. And what happens in that situation is folks don't have access points to care. So if you look at what we can do in virtual health, and what we do at Hims and Hers, we do both synchronous and asynchronous visits, although a lot of our visits are actually asynchronous. And so what is that? That is essentially you look for information about a condition you may have. You put it in the Google, you Google it up, and then we put content on the Internet. For example, hair loss. You can go on the Internet, take, internet today and put hair loss, and you'll see content that we create curated content from hims and hers and it will direct you to our platform and then 24 uh, 7 you can get access to a provider that's either a physician or a nurse practitioner and they can answer your through this intake form you you enter all your questions all your past medical history we get a full view of the customer uh, the provider then looks at it examines it and then you have two we two-way chat between the provider and the and the customer, the patient. And then if you qualify for medication and we think the medication can help, you actually get a prescription written for you and it gets sent to you. So you don't have to go to the Walgreens or the CVS. You get your questions answered and guess what? 24 seven, 360 days a year, 365 days a year, you can reconnect with the provider. We don't shut our doors at 5 p.m. We're open on weekends. We have full access 24 seven. And I think that's the other piece that health systems, I think, are struggling with is really the consumer expectations have increased tremendously over the past 10 years. And most health systems are, are now getting in line with this, but it's really about customer centricity. They want care 24-7 on their schedule, particularly in that millennial and younger group. They are not going online to establish with a primary care physician they don't do that very often. What they do is they Google up a symptom and they're looking for access to care on their schedule. And so those two areas, both in terms of workforce shortage, as well as that consumer focused uh, aspect, we check the boxes on that at Hims and Hers and as do many of um, digital health companies. In terms of exactly, it's, it's kind of figuring out how do we meet the needs of today's patients so that we can get them the care they need so they're compliant, so that they stay on treatment, so they're taking care of themselves, because we need more than just a doctor saying so now, right? Yes. That, that's kind of where we've come to. Yeah. yeah. And I'll give you a prime example on that is um, we've got a real mental health problem in this country in terms of access. You know, if you actually look at what happened through the pandemic, the rates for, you know, anxiety and depression skyrocketed. You know, some, some folks had shown studies, 30 to 40% of folks were struggling with some form of anxiety and depression. Most people with mental health issues 
don't know how to get their foot in the door in the system. Do I do, go to a counselor? Do I get to go to my family physician? Some family physicians are not comfortable prescribing medication. Do I need yeah. to see a psychiatrist? Well, guess what? If you want to access a psychiatrist in this country, it's really difficult. Over 50% don't even take insurance. The other piece to that, it can take you up to eight to 10 weeks to get into a prescriber. Um, and counseling can be as just as difficult to access. So at Hims and Hers, that was the impetus for us to open up mental health as one of our verticals. Really high quality care, um, usually less than four to five hours, you can access a prescriber, either a psychiatrist, psychiatric nurse practitioner, or a primary care physician who's trained in mental health care. Uh, you can get your questions answered. You can determine whether you qualify for medications or not. And if you do, you get regular follow-up, you get your medication sent to you, and we track your progress through things like a GAD7 and a PHQ8 throughout your treatment course. And so our mental health business has taken off over the last 18 months because of the access it provides, high quality of care it provides, but also filling the need of the customer. And we heard that loud and clear. No, and that's fantastic. But then a lot of these virtual care solutions and the digital health solutions, quite frankly, need to work hand in hand with existing um, um, aspects of the health system, right? With the traditional health system. What are some of the key benefits and challenges of the integration? And how have you approached that uh, in your time at Hims and HERS? And is that something, a, a lesson that can be carried more broadly of, hey, yes, we have this new modality. It can do a lot of things, but there's still certain reasons why we want to make sure it's integrated with and speaks to existing healthcare tradition, if you will, absolutely. to make sure we're, we're providing comprehensive solutions. Yeah, absolutely, Mina. So as we look at launching a new vertical, a new offering, the first thing we we talk about is, can we offer something that's equally, if not better in quality than brick and mortar? And that's not everything. You know, we'd, we'd have a hard time managing an ICU level patient, honestly. We just don't have those <laughs> capabilities. We don't have the monitoring as part of our offering. But there are certain conditions that we can offer really high quality care that is comparable to brick and mortar. Um, so if you actually look at even for mental health, we're really focused on anxiety and depression. We screen out for the more complex conditions. We don't do controlled substances very intentionally because we don't feel like that's appropriate um, for a virtual platform like ours. Other companies could do that, but you have to put in a lot more uh, infrastructure to do that. And, and we've decided, you know, we're going to focus on the anxiety and depression. For every one of our verticals, though, there is a percentage of our customers who, when we do our screening, when they do the intake form, we identify, hey, you're probably too complex for this modality, um, and you probably need a referral into a brick-and-mortar location. We estimate that 50% of our customers, even though they may have a physician, they couldn't identify it. They couldn't identify the person, right? Oh, I think I have a physician, but I don't know who that is. Yeah. And so for me, a big impetus to establish some relationship with health systems, it's really about closing the quality loop. So over the last four years, we're slowly but surely developing more relationships with traditional health systems to get folks referred into them for these more complex patients who are referring off. We have relationships with Oshner, Mount Sinai in New York, uh, Christiana Care, just signed one with Hartford Healthcare in Hartford, Connecticut. We have relationship with Carbon Health, uh, Privia Health. Um, all of these groups that can provide brick and mortar in-person care that are actually catchment areas for folks who need more intervention um, than we can provide in the virtual environment. Um, even when someone comes on our platform, one of the questions we always ask, do you have a primary care physician? Do you want us to share this information with them? So we want folks to get integrated in to the traditional system. Uh, we're just part of the patient-centered medical home. We're not the patient centers. We're not the patient's medical home. We're part of it. And, and the more we work together with traditional healthcare, the more beneficial it is for traditional healthcare, but also in terms of quality for our customers. No, that completely makes sense. When you think about all the pressing issues in our country today, Right. And we've talked about mental health. We've talked about access to care. We've talked about disparities to care, the lack of uh, enough providers. What would you consider the most pressing issue and how, if at all, can digital health help there? 
Um, I look at the pressing issues in a few different areas. One is affordability. You know, we're a cash pay business. People say, how can you do that in healthcare? Well, the bottom line is more and more folks are on high deductible health plans through their employers. And many of them have deductibles of over $1,500 a year. And so essentially, if we can offer care in connection with the provider and your medications delivered for, let's say, less than $40 or $50 per month, at the end of the year, they're paying less than the deductible. So we're providing very affordable care for all of our verticals without folks even having to submit it to insurance, which guess what? They wouldn't pay for it anyways because you're below your deductible um, in these high deductible health plans. So I think affordability is one. Other is access, and we've talked about that. We provide really great access to care. To get on a platform and to get connected with the provider in less than six hours, that's amazing. You just don't get that in traditional healthcare all the time. And then I think the other area is that whole consumer centricity and consumer expectations, which I don't think we meet in traditional healthcare all the time. I think we fall below what customers' expectations are. You know, when I practice medicine, you know, it's going back even 12 years ago, it was a lot more paternalistic. You know, someone comes in, they see me for 15 minutes. Here's, here's what you have. Here's your medication. I'll see you back in three to six months, right? And I tell them what to do. I had no visibility whether they took the medication, whether I answered all their questions. And I think often they felt like, well, I'm not going to bother Dr. Carroll. You know, I'm not going to go back and, you know, call him or get information. I'll, I'll just wait for my regular schedule appointment. So if you look at what we do, which is really unique, we are totally fully integrated. So we not only provide the content and education for folks, they come on our platform, they have this provider interaction and visit. And then if they get prescribed medication, that medication comes from us. So we have complete visibility in terms of adherence. So when patients came into my primary care practice, for example, if I started someone on a medication, I didn't know whether they took it or not. I'd see them in three to six months and I'd say, do you take your medication? <laughs> yeah. I never got the data from anybody. <laughs> if I got to try to get it from insurance company, it's a three to six month delay. We see yeah. from start to finish the entire customer journey, including whether they're adherent or not. And that's hugely powerful for us. We're able to send out regular reminders to customers. We call them virtual check-ins. How are you doing? Here are the common side effects that you might have. Are you having any of these? Do we need to adjust your medication? Um, have you been taking your medications? And so it's a system that has more touch points than I ever had in a primary care model. And I think that's really important uh, because customers, patients want to feel like uh, you're, you're important. To, they're important. And, and, and you're doing outreach because you care. And it's not just two to three times per year as in a traditional practice. It's constant outreach. Um, when I think about all the benefits that digital healthcare has for these patient populations, right? Like you were saying, there's so many different benefits, both to the provider that's trying to take care of them in holistic fashion, as well as to the patient themselves. One of the things that um, I, we run into a lot, and I'm curious as to, to if we, whether you do and how you handle it, is there are diverse populations that are looking for care. Right. And, you know, to, to have a certain, you have to have a certain level of savviness and sophistication and technology and access to take the care, you know, to get the benefits of digital health. Um, how do we make sure going forward that for services like yours, et cetera, that we have the ability to reach diverse populations, again, that they themselves might have diverse backgrounds, diverse resources, diverse aptitudes, um, to try and get this access out as broadly as possible? Yeah, that is a great question. And and I look at particularly asynchronous care where we don't even have to be in a video like you and I are on. Essentially, you're doing a visit off a cell phone, a mobile device. 85% of our visits are done off a mobile device. To me, that is access to care with low technology. There are some communities in this country, as you know, that they just don't have the, you know, the bandwidth, literally, to connect for video visits. But if you can do a high quality visit off just communication asynchronously 24 seven off a cell phone device, to me, that's the democratization of healthcare. And, and we hear that from our customers, particularly we've heard a lot of that in mental health is, 
you know, we've gotten such positive feedback. We have high NPS, 76 for our mental health platform. And, and customers come back to us and say, I love the fact that I can access care. It's affordable and I'm getting regular follow-up. And we're reaching customers where they live in their community. And in many cases, we're doing that asynchronously in the states that will allow it. Now, there are some states where we're required to do synchronous visits and we can do the video visits, but we've found our own customers, they love asynchronous modality. They don't necessarily want to get on a video with someone they don't know. You know, they, they like that anonymity. They love the anonymity of it, to tell you the truth. Exactly. You can get your question answered. And, and that's, you know, uh, for better or for worse, that's partly why we all have inbox issues that we do today, right? <laughs> Especially when doctors talk about, oh my gosh, I'm not getting paid for the two hours of emails that I just answered from patients this afternoon. Exactly. Right? So, <laughs> um, looking towards the future, then, just to wrap it up here, is how do you envision the role of companies like Hims and hers evolving in the healthcare ecosystem? in terms of the trends or innovations in digital health that we should all be keeping an eye on and trying to see if we can we can push further, uh, quite frankly, across across broader swaths of the country and the population. Yeah, you know, um, again, coming from the health system world, I think there's a growing recognition among them, forward thinking health systems like Christiana Care that uh, they're new competitors in the space, right? Not only retail health with the mm -hmm. Walgreens, CVS and Walmart, but the digital health companies like Hims and hers and companies like us. And so I see a space where they are reaching out and they're saying, Hey, we'd love to have some kind of collaboration with you folks. You know, money is not exchanged necessarily. Yeah. It's really just about, we know they're more complex patients you're identifying, get them plugged into our, your, our system. We can help you out with that. And to me, that closes the quality loop. So I think there is there's room for more collaboration between the traditional players with companies like Kim's and hers. And there's tremendous opportunities for growth in that space. Uh, believe me, you know, when you're talking about a four and a half trillion dollar part of our economy, there's plenty of room to improve what we do in healthcare. And there's plenty of room for, you know, uh, companies like Kim's and hers, just like we need uh, the traditional brick and mortar health systems. But I think we can do better working together with the common goal of access affordability and um, trying to make this work better for the customer being really, really customer consumer centric. So I just see this tremendous opportunity in growth in this space. I think the difficult thing, however, in the startup mode is that there was a lot of money being thrown at, at digital telehealth, you know, even as recently as two years ago. And um, there's been kind of a retrenchment on that. And so I think it's, it gets more and more difficult to, to have and start a company like Kim's and hers, which successfully was able to go public and is, you know, is, is doing well uh, because it's very time intensive and it's work intensive and it's complicated to, to get a, a digital health company up and running and successful so you can keep going into the future and expand new offerings like we've recently done with weight loss and do it successfully, both for your company, but more importantly, to the customer. No, that, that makes complete sense. Um, and I am looking forward to seeing what you do with hims and hers, not just with where they are today, but it sounds like you've got big plans for where they're going to play in the future and where else they can help with. Absolutely. So I'm Mina. excited to see that. Yeah, we're excited too. And uh, uh, thanks so much for having me on this. It's always good to inform folks of what we're doing because many people like myself, when I was applying for the job, had no idea what hymns and hers was about. Yeah. Now I really yeah. know. Or, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or they see it as like, you know, this narrow solution where you don't realize, hey, there's actually the potential and the ability to take it broader and, and impact the broader part of the, of the population. So Absolutely. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to talking to you again soon. Likewise, Mina.